बार बार एग्जाम दे रहे हैं और रिजल्ट नहीं आ रहा है और इतना अच्छा स्कोर नहीं आ रहा है स्पीकिंग में बार बार फेल हो रहे हैं जो सबसे ईजी सेक्शन है क्या करें कैसे करें बार बार एग्जाम देने के बाद भी स्कोर नहीं आ रहा है किस तरह से बोले कोई कह रहा है बड़ा तेज बोलना है कोई कह रहा है कि आराम से बोलना है कोई कह रहा है कि चीख के बोलना है कोई कह रहा है धीमे से बोलना है तो आप कुछ कुछ परेशान हो चुके हैं अलग अलग तरीके से आपने एग्जाम दे दिए हैं और अभी आपका रिजल्ट नहीं आ रहा है जस्ट मैसेज मी आज एस की यू टिप फॉर दैट जस्ट सेंड मी योर ऑडियो दैट्स अ स्पेशल ऑफर फॉर ऑल ऑफ यू मुझे अपनी ऑडियो भेजिए आज जस्ट चेक आउट यूर ऑडियो ऑनलाइन एंड जस्ट की द इवेल्यूएशन ऑन द बिहाफ ऑफ टू यू सो आई जस्ट टेल यू कि कितना टाइम आपको लगने वाला है हाउ मेनी फैक्टर्स एंड द सेक्टर्स यू हैव टू वर्क फॉर सो एवरी टाइम आई एम जस्ट रेडी फॉर यू इफ यू वॉन्ट टू गेट अ वैरिज कोड इन पी टी जस्ट कॉल मी एंड जस्ट मैसेज मे एनी टाइम हैव अस डे बाय बाय Why should we read the Republic? Hmm. I imagine lots of students ask this question to themselves when they're given it as a set book at the beginning of their university course. But in fact, um, there are many good reasons to read the Republic, and the first first one I would pick on is just that it is immensely readable. Immensely readable. It's not. Plato did not write philosophy uh, a, like a dry textbook. He wrote it like a living conversation. The whole of the Republic, which is a fairly fat book, is a living conversation written in short, almost soundbite type answers, but nevertheless developing some very, very important ideas. Um, so my first answer then, we should read the Republic just because it is readable. It was written by a genius and it's worth reading. It's easy to read. It's not difficult. But then there's also obviously the, the, the thought, the content of the book. And he's asking this absolutely fundamental question. Why should we bother to be good? What's in it for us, effectively? Um, it seems when we look at the world, it looks as though injustice pays. It looks as though crime pays, whereas the good people get trodden down. So Plato addresses this absolutely fundamental question, why should we be good? I'm not going to tell you his answer. Read the book.
23,000 years ago, towards the end of the Old Stone Age, also known as the Upper Paleolithic, the weather in Europe and in many parts of the world took a turn for the worse. Temperatures plummeted, rain levels fell and a massive ice sheet slowly advanced to cover most of northern Europe and stayed there for the next few, th for the next few thousand years. We know that during this glacial period, many animal and plant species sought shelter in Europe's three warmer southern peninsulas, Iberia, Italy and the Balkans. But the question is, where did the people go? Archaeological material recovered from this time period has shown that a large number of our ancestors retreated to Franco-Cantabria, an area covering the southwest of France and northeastern tip of Spain. But was this the only area where people travelled to to escape the worst of the weather? Let's go back to the growing ice sheet. In order to grow, the ice mass had to take up water, causing sea levels to fall. At its maximum, when the ice reached as far south as Germany, sea levels were up to 120 metres lower than today. That's approximately the same height as the London Eye. As a result, areas of shallow sea became exposed and Europe's shape was very different to the one we recognise. It could be that humans lived on these exposed shores during the Paleolithic, but we have no evidence of their settlements because it's now all underwater.
a discussion in a history class. Did anyone happen to catch the American Metropolis last night? It was about the growth of cities. I didn't see that, but I did see part of a documentary last week that told about a guy. I think he was a visitor from another country, who wrote a book about the growth of industry and so on and so on. The things we've just studied. I remember he said there was a huge population explosion that turned America into a nation of cities all within a decade. He was talking mostly about Baltimore. Baltimore, and then or now? In the 19th century, right after the Civil War. The program you saw was part of the same series as the one I want to tell you about. Last night, the topic was New York City. As early as 1880, the federal government wrote a report on how the five separate municipalities of New York actually constituted one vast metropolitan area. It was a progressive way of thinking at the time, and within 20 years, those five municipalities were officially united as a single city by a vote of the people. To this day, however, each borough maintains traces of its original independence. I agree with that. I'm from Brooklyn, and it's definitely diff- different from the rest of New York. Readjusting to life in your own country after living abroad for some time is a little like recovering from jet lag after a long flight across several time zones. It takes time, and research indicates that after nine years of living in a foreign country, you, you never really do readjust. Of course, things have changed. Governments have come and gone. What you knew as countryside has become a suburb. New technologies have changed the way people go about their daily lives, and so on. These changes may well have been taking place in your adopted country, but they were happening while you were there, so you could adapt as you went along. Those are not the main difficulties, however. It is in the smaller, everyday things that you might experience what is known as culture shock, although it's not really a shock, but puzzling all the same. For example, the precise way to behave at a supermarket checkout may have changed, and in ordinary conversation, the frames of reference have changed, and quite often you find that you don't really know what people are talking about. Even though they are speaking your native tongue. Few cities had a worse location than St. Petersburg in Russia. In 1703, Russian Tsar Peter I began building a great European city for himself, St. Petersburg. There were three main problems with this city. Firstly, he decided to construct his beautiful capital at the mouth of a at the mouth of a river. The land around the site was under water most of the time and was either frozen or flooded. Over a hundred thousand construction workers died working in such difficult conditions. 
The second problem was the availability of construction workers. Few people lived in that area, and the high death rate meant that Peter needed to bring in a constant supply of replacement workers from other parts of Russia. Using the military service system, he ordered 40,000 men each year to go and work on his capital. The men were expected to provide their own tools and food for the journey, often with soldiers watching over them, and they were chained together to prevent them from running away. Illness was everywhere, and punishments went from whipping to death. The final problem was supplying the materials themselves. Whole forests were cleared to provide wood, hills flattened and lakes filled in. Stone, stone became so hard to find that Peter banned anyone else in Russia from using it. It was a truly impossible city to build and made him unpopular. Dr. Tony Wagner believes there are seven skills that young people need to have in order for them to find and keep a good job in today's economy. But he thinks our schools are focusing too much on tests and academic performance and aren't doing enough to teach those skills. Let me give you an, let me give you an example. One of Wagner's seven skills is the ability to work in an international team. This is because little teamwork is carried out in one building anymore. When most global companies have a problem, they create teams of people from all over the world to solve it. And these people meet online, in virtual meeting rooms. To succeed in this kind of environment, you need to be a good communicator and understand different cultures. Teams also need good leaders, who lead by influencing others, but Wagner and the business people he interviewed say that young people today are unprepared for teamwork and leadership. Because of this, Wagner thinks that people involved in teaching and learning must rethink the way that they educate people in schools so that these young people have the skills they need to achieve a successful career in the 21st century. Good afternoon, Miss Davis. I was told by James that you wanted to see me in your office. Oh, I did. How are you? Is everything going fine? Yes, pretty much. What about you, Miss Davis? I haven't seen you for a while. Yes, I was away for a while. Actually, I went to Arizona and met your mother there. Didn't she tell, didn't she tell you about it? No, she didn't, but that's great. How is she? She is fine. To me, she is still as exuberant as she was 20 years ago. You will never know how great a teacher your mother was. Anyway, how was your semester? It was fun. The teachers were nice, especially Ms. McKenna. I loved her class. Strange, I never liked math and struggled so much until I met Ms. McKenna. That's great. How was she so wonderful? She spoke softly and explained thoroughly. She answered all of the questions earnestly. Many of her students made that comment in the past, too. Who could have guessed that I could get an A in math? Why not? You're smart. You can get an A in any subject you want as long as you try. I believe so. I should have tried harder instead of giving up and neglecting the hard subjects.
The nature-nurture debate is still going on. It is not a question of taking sides because we know that both play an important part in what makes us who we are. It is more a question of emphasis. Which of them has the greatest influence? On the nature side, we have what we get from our genes, our genes, our inherited traits, eye color and other physical traits, for example, but also, some believe, non-physical ones, such as temperament. For example, you might be quick to anger or have a nervous temperament, and this even extends to sense of humor. On the nurture side, there is what we get from our environment and our upbringing, what we learn. Research into the human genome has recently made it clear that both sides are partly right. Nature gives us inborn abilities and traits, while nurture takes these genetic tendencies and shapes them as we grow and learn and mature. This is an important point, as it means, contrary to the belief of some, that we are not wholly determined by our genes. Scientists have known for years that eye and hair color are determined by specific genes. But some now claim that such traits as intelligence and personality are also encoded in our genes. Hiroshi Ishiguro, a robot engineer from Osaka University, makes Geminoids, extremely realistic human robots. Geminoid robots have rubber skin and their heads are controlled by motors. These move the head, blink, twitch, shrug the shoulders and make the robot appear to be breathing during conversations. As well as this, there are motors which are connected to a computer, microphone and camera. The robot's body and skin stop at his chest, though. And he has no robotic legs, so you won't see him. In the 19th century, there were several periods when large numbers of people moved from one place to another around the world. In many cases, people moved to another continent. These mass migrations were on a much larger scale than any previous migrations in history. In history. One major movement was from Europe to the Americas. Australia, and Africa. This migration of Europeans involved around 60 million people over 100 years. Another mass migration was from Russia to Siberia and Central Asia. Another was from China, India, and Japan to Southeast Asia. 
These large movements of people were made possible by the new cheap and fast means of... Archery, the practice or art of shooting with a bow and arrow, has played an important part in English history, being the main weapon of the foot soldier and instrumental in winning many battles in wars with the French, with whom we seem to be constantly at war during the, in the Middle Ages. The English favoured the long bow over the short bow and the crossbow, the latter being the main firearm of militaries on the European continent. Stanford University School of Medicine researchers are developing inexpensive adapters that let smartphones take high-quality images of the eye. Not just the lens in front, but the retina in the back, too, with no need for eye drops that dilate your pupils for hours. The research team is studying the quality of images taken using the adapt adapters and their ability to track eye disease in patients with diabetes. This work was published online in the Journal of Mobile Technology and Medicine.
postmodernism is broadly speaking a reaction against the movement or the period, or perhaps simply the values and beliefs of modernism. Most people, even those who seem to know what it is or was about, tend to define it in negative terms by telling telling us what it isn't or doesn't do. Initially, the term had a fairly limited application and referred to a new anti-modernist style of architecture.